Okay, so moving on to item number uh, six, uh, we have with us uh, Chief uh, Kevin Lewis. Uh, Chief Lewis has been here before. Uh, last year, uh, in fall, he was here, uh, and he spoke about uh, what uh, the RCMP uh, is doing to keep our city safe. And uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Chief Lewis uh, to uh, tell us more about the progress that's been made. Um, now, Chief's been here for uh, four years, so he's, he's got a good insight as to, you know, whether the crime rate's going up, down. But uh, I'll let him uh, talk to us about uh, um, the activities of uh, the RCMP in town. Hello, again. All right, some of you have probably heard this before. It's not much changes, but, uh, but anyways, I have some new stats for you just to give you a sense of what's happened since 2016 in Thompson in regards to the RCMP. And uh, again, when I'm talking statistics, uh, it's specific to the city of Thompson and not uh, the rural detachments that we also service. Uh, outside of city, the city of Thompson, we also uh, look after to do Lac Roche, Roche, York, uh, and uh, Thicket, etc. So um, those stats are not included in these ones. So, <clears throat> so um, just in comparison uh, from 2016 to 2017 is the stats I'm going to give you just to give you an idea um, how we're seeing our crime trends slowly increase uh, in certain areas while other areas are decreasing. And uh, they're not going to be a surprise to anybody either. It's pretty consistent and um, in some areas, well, some are, are a little bit more uh, obvious, I guess. So when we look at sexual assaults for 2016, there was 46. And in 2017, there's 58, so there's an increase there. Um, assaults, just general assaults, whether it's um, uh, a bar fight, whether it's uh, a couple kids at the school, whether it's um, uh, you know some of the uh, somebody squabbling over a bottle outside the liquor store, uh, those types of events. We had uh, 1,040 in 2016, and in 2017, 1,006. So. <clears throat> When you look at our population base of uh, just over, you know, around the 14,000 mark, and then you take those numbers, it, it seems very high, doesn't it? Yeah. So, uh, domestic assaults, so that would be between a, uh, a spouse, you're looking at 188 for 2016 and 282 for 2017, so a, a large spike in domestic assaults. <clears throat> now, what's causing them? I don't know. So, maybe it's, uh, you know, we do see trends with... Um, economic disparity in some cases where there's more stress in homes as a result of uh, economic downturn sometimes but I can't speak to exactly what the cause of those ones are only those folks know. Theft, so uh, that'd be theft over a thousand dollars, theft under a thousand dollars, frauds, those types of events. We dealt with uh, 69 in 2016 and 106 in 2017 so we're seeing an increase in those types of events. Now many of those will be the, the Kids checking the door handles of cars at night um, in the summertime. We've seen a spike of those uh, this summer until we caught them. So um, you're going to get those trends where you have a group of people doing certain type of crime and then they get caught and then it goes back down. So, uh, and that's common in every, every place regardless of where you are. So, and um, if we're looking at um, public disorder events, so We've seen 4,450 in 2016 and 4,945 in uh, 2017. So that again is uh, the downtown um, uh, crowd for the most part. Uh, Intoxicated Person Detec Detention Act arrests disturbances where people are causing a disturbance, whether it's uh, somebody inside a w or somebody inside McDonald's, somebody inside the mall, uh, those types of events. <clears throat> Drugs, so we had 150 um, Drug events in uh, 2016 and 147 in 2017. Other criminal codes such as mischief. Um, so again, mischief could be somebody intoxicated in a house. It could be uh, a car scratched or tires uh, deflated with a knife. <clears throat> we'll be looking at uh, in and about 1,900 of those in 2016 and 2,400 in 2017. So again, 
a lot of youth activity with relation to the, the mischief. Uh, a lot of those are disturbances inside residences where we arrest the person for mischief for causing uh, or disturbing the lawful enjoyment of the residents inside there. And uh, liquor offenses, 340 in 2016, 297 in 2017. So <clears throat> seeing a little bit of a dip there. Criminal code traffic. Um, again, that would be collisions and those type of things that are, are related to uh, a crime. Uh, 21 in 2016 and 2017, we've seen 30. And um, traffic tickets have gone up quite a bit, actually. It, you can view it as whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. And the most part, uh, traffic tickets increase as a result of our members. Um, usually when we get new members, you'll get certain people that really like to do traffic and some that don't. So in this case, we do have a handful of new people out of training that really like to go out and, and give tickets. So I don't know if any of you, the recipient, are a little bit sensitive to this issue, but uh, so 623 in 2016 and uh, 1,039 in 2017. So big, uh, big jump there. Uh, and it's interesting because I've seen um, in Quebec that uh, they have quotas, right? And we don't have any quotas, so don't worry about that. We're, there's no expectation for our members to give a certain amount of tickets. So I don't get a raise based on it. So. Collisions, 193 in 2016, 207 in 2017. And again, that's mainly weather dependent. So, of course, we have a snow event. You see lots of accidents. So, uh, there's quite a few this year already. So, uh, uh, homicide, 2016, we've seen three. 2017, we've seen three. So, on par. I like it better when it's zero. But um, again, some of those are just uncontrollable and uh, are incidents within the home. You know, it's, it's funny because you look at Thompson and uh, was it 2015 or 2014 or zero, um, 2013, zero. And then um, years before that, there was seven in one year, you know. So it just depends. Like it depends on, um, on the year. Like it's consistent if you want to call it in terms of um, population for some communities that have the same uh, type of social issues that we do. So you look up at the territories, very consistent uh, numbers based on population. Missing persons. So um, in 2016, we've seen 1,773 of these. And um, in 2017, 1,835. So a marginal increase there. So when I say missing persons, it's not... <coughs> majority of those aren't people that have gone missing. They're um, our AWOL youth that are um, uh, in the group homes, and they didn't come back for curfew. So we see a ton of them which puts a lot of uh, extra, extra work on our folks uh, at the detachment level. So, um, so just to give you an example of how that would work. So somebody doesn't come home for their 10 o'clock curfew, uh, the RCMP get called by the staff at the group home, and um, we would spend the night looking for those, uh, those kids that don't want to be found, essentially. And, uh, but we've got to find them because they're high risk in most cases, and we've got to make every effort we can to locate them. So... And usually they come home within an hour or two, maybe five, six hours later, or we find them at uh, somewhere where we know them to be located, right? So in the past. So that's kind of the, uh, the trend that we're seeing. Um, in 2014, our numbers actually started to, to go down. Uh, 2015 started to go down. 2016, we started to see that little bit of an increase. 2017, we see the increase. So I um, spoke at the council meeting um, a couple weeks ago, and... Um, one of the big things that we're seeing in Thompson right now is just that large influx of people from uh, outlying communities that are just coming to Thompson and staying here and uh, using it as the mini Vegas, right? So uh, they come here and enjoy themselves and they don't leave and um, uh, they end up using up the goods and services of the, of the community. So, and um, they drive up a lot of the, the calls for service in terms of public intoxication, assaults, um, sexual assaults, those types of events. So. Any questions on the stats before I get into the rest? It's not, de it's not that depressing. Don't be depressing. Yes. Yeah. All three are sold. Yeah. And uh, as uh, we were just discussing, uh, I don't want these stats to make anybody feel that Thompson is an unsafe place to live. Like, it's, it's safe. It's safe for regular working folks that are going about their daily activities and living life without uh, high risk influence in their life, right? So if you're um, partaking in uh, high levels of alcohol consumption and hanging around with other crowds that do such, then you're gonna run into these types of events, right? So, um, you know, it's, uh, 
they fit hand in hand. The drug culture, heavy alcohol consumption, um, they're all going to tie into some type of criminal activity, as we see with these numbers. So. Do you find the transients, they're getting younger and younger, that they're coming to town? Yeah, like yeah, yeah. So, it, you know, it's a cycle. As, um, as the older crowd, uh, you know, as some people uh, die, the next crew comes in and they, uh, they fill the ranks, right? So, yeah, it's just... It's no different than any other community I've been into. Like I've talked before about, uh, I was up in Yellowknife in Iqaluit, exactly the same. So you have a transient population that, that likes to live that lifestyle, that uh, is bizarre to the rest of us, that um, like to go home at the end of the day and, and uh, you know, spend time with your family. A lot of these individuals, they don't want to do that. They want to be out in the street and hanging around with their social, their social uh, network. And uh, that's comfort and home to them. So it's uh, so a different way of thinking for the rest of us, but that's home to them. So. Oof, that is a good question. There's probably, um, I think at the top of my head, three going back to like within the last 15, 20 years. So. Going back all the way to the ground. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can think of three, and there there could be more. So. Yeah. Yeah. These stats Sorry. And Bernie Carlson. Yeah. Those are the three. That's the three that I can think of right now. Yeah. They're right do these stats take into account the community officers that mm -hmm. CSRC? You bet. These are all, these are all combined. Yeah, you bet. So when the CSOs, uh, so we have community safety officers, which are a great help to us because they take a lot of the uh, the extra work off our hands for dealing with, in specific, uh, the downtown core. So um, if we, uh, rather than the RCMP getting the calls, in, in most cases that uh, there's somebody passed out in the bathroom at uh, the mall or something like that, the CSOs get those calls now. So 90% of the time which uh, saves us from having to, to go down to the mall, deal with that person, process the prisoner, uh, possibly bring them to the hospital, you know, that type of thing. Um, so you're looking at a savings of, a, you know, half an hour, 40 minutes for two members to go do that um, versus having the CSOs do it. So it's a great resource for us as the RCMP to have the CSOs. So um, kudos to them for taking that load off of us for the most part. But those numbers are captured because what happens is... Um, when the CSOs bring a prisoner into our cells, that chalks up as a, uh, a prisoner for us and we have to enter into our system, so it is a disturbance call. So everyone they pick up gets logged in as one of our calls for service. So, so there's not a separate number. All part of our stats, yeah, yeah. So it, it's good because it captures a, uh, an accurate reflection of what's happening in the community and there's not two different entities of, of um, I guess, stat keeping that's you know, not being portrayed, right? So. Mm -hmm. Well, there. Uh, I know we used to have an individual that used to do that on his own, and um, I think he still does that to some degree. And then we have the COPP that does a little bit here and there. So, again, it's not so much up to the RCMP to establish that. It would be a community venture that uh, um, that somebody wants to take that on. So. It is, yeah, yeah. Not related to the Winnipeg Police Service or anybody else. It's a, a private organization. Anything else on that? Stats? And everyone gets depressed when I talk stats. Eh? <laughs> it's not bad. It's not that bad. So, a um, couple other things I'll just talk about quick is, uh, so Project Detox, I don't know if some of you guys might have heard about it, but um, so what we came up with about uh, a year ago now is uh, Project Detox where where we have a lot of our, um, uh, we'll call them our problem folks from the downtown in particular that uh, are frequenting businesses and uh, um, being a nuisance in general, not really being a customer, but they're being a nuisance and, um, or that we come in contact with on a regular basis. Those folks there, we end up charging them with one count of cause disturbance, go back six months and um, highlight all the times that we've dealt with them and that the CSOs have dealt with them in a capacity where they're a community nuisance causing a disturbance, intoxicated, those types of things, and sending it to the courts with a, um, a request for a court-imposed dry out period and some type of long-term counseling. So that's the intention of our Project Detox is to try to get these folks back on their feet and as well as helping the community by getting rid of the visible nuisance that's, uh, that's out there and helping out the businesses to some degree with not having this person visit them on a regular basis. So um, so we're, we're waiting to kind of see how that's going to pan out long term, if 
what the benefits are of that and maybe what some of the cons are of that. But uh, as, a, as a policing agency, I hate to see us just picking up an individual and then in eight hours, here you go, back out again and we'll see you in three hours, right? So we want to do something that's got a little bit more uh, substantial effort put into it where it's, uh, you know, we involve the, the courts, uh, we involve some of the other agencies that can do some counseling and things like that so that we're not just creating a revolving door and being part of the problem, we want to be part of a solution, right? So anyways, we'll see how it pans out long term, but um, in only time will tell. So that's Project Detox. And um, I know one of the big topics that uh, we don't know a heck of a lot about right now is the cannabis uh, legalization, just because it's coming so quick. Um, the government is still, federal government is still working on uh, amending the criminal code to uh, determine um, you know, what the intoxication levels are going to be for impaired driving. And so there's going to be all kinds of legislation changes in there, which are actually going to be very beneficial for us as law enforcement, for dealing with impaired driving, for, um, uh, you know, cannabis-related, uh, cocaine-related uh, driving offenses. So right now we have a limited scope to deal with, um, but that'll help us broaden it and, and be much more effective in, in dealing with uh, individuals. How do you tell if someone's under the influence of cannabis? I mean, Obvious with alcohol and you have a breathalyzer yeah. and a way of proving it, but how do you prove someone? Because it's a huge concern once it's legal and there's going to be a lot of people driving. Yep. How do you determine whether they're under the influence and make it stick per se? Yeah, so what's going to happen is, uh, so just like we have a roadside screening device for uh, alcohol, there's going to be one for, for uh, cannabis. So it'll be, um, uh, right now there's two models that are being tested and um, uh, they have to be regulated within the criminal code too, so it has to be gazetted uh, and uh, authorized to be used across Canada. So it's a little bit of a process and it's quite expensive. So they're doing their testing on it to make sure that they're getting the right one if they're gonna spend all the money on it. And um, so they're looking at, um, it's gonna be able to tell you if somebody has uh, a certain amount of uh, cannabis in their system. And um, it'll be um, uh, like a, uh, an oral swab type thing, so. Right now, that's the idea. So. Would somebody, would they have to spit on that swab? Because that's what I was told by somebody that they would have to spit on it. Yeah. I'm I, thinking that would be horrible for the officers. You know, <laughs> yeah, and it's not quite a spit. It's, a, it's you know, like a, a swab of the inside of the mouth, and that would uh, get enough of the sample, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is good. Yeah. <laughs> You're going yeah. to become a really good prospect for a dentist. Then. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. So... Anyway, so that'll be very beneficial for us for determining if people are uh, <coughs> consuming. You got it? Yeah. Biggest hindrance is dry mouth, I guess. Yeah, 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 exactly. So... Type, is that type of a test going to become available for employers too? Have you ever seen anything like that? I, I doubt it, piece? yeah. If you're working any, anywhere, yep. you know, people are whacked out of shape. They've, they've got those issues now in mm -hmm. places where they have... Mm -hmm. Yeah, some employers require it, anything requiring, uh, you know, machinery to be operated, those types of things, and they can do their testing on their own as a requirement for employment. So, um, yeah, it can be done. It's just uh, it won't be a screen device. It would probably be more of a urine test. So, so all this is evolving as, uh, you know, as it's kind of thrown at us, right, because we didn't have much time to prepare as any policing agency. You know, we're all going through the same thing where we're trying to catch up to what's going on, and the, the government has come so quick with this legislation. It's... Uh, it's going to be quick, so um, and it may even be delayed to some degree. They're talking that July mark, but it's not really set in stone, so we're not really sure. But um, we're hoping to have everything ironed out before then, obviously, because you're going to be dealing with it day one. Yeah, you're going to be dealing with it. So we already have tools in place in terms of um, we have sobriety uh, individuals that can um, uh, test people uh, through their, um, you know, the size of their pupils, uh, doing roadside, um, you know, walking, those types of things. So we have people that can do that for. Uh, intoxication by cocaine, uh, marijuana, and uh, you know prescription drugs. And it's illegal at age 15 to use. Oh, I, I think so. Yeah, I think so. I can't remember off the top of my head, but uh, there's so much literature on it right now. It's uh, yeah, I think it is actually to be honest with you. So it's going to be this similar. Yeah. 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 There was. He went back to the same age. Yeah. So I'm not sure. Hmm. Yeah, 25. Be 21. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, we'll see. And again, nothing's finalized. It's all kind of still up in the air. So, but uh, so the provinces started their um, regulations to uh, establish what they're they're looking for. 
uh, which would be another enforceable system, right, so in terms of tickets and things like that. Just like we do with traffic tickets, it's a provincial thing, not a federal thing. So it's kind of two different streams. You get the federal one for criminal charges for impaired driving, then you'll have the provincial system to do tickets for other types of things like, uh, uh, you know, the smoking in public, that type of thing. So, and then you'll have the city creating their own bylaws as to, you know, uh, who can have, um, yeah, who can manufacture it, uh, you know, the zoning, things like that. So, and then as well as establish where and uh, when people can consume, right? So not only the smoking, you're going to have the edibles, which is going to be another challenge because it's not going to be very detectable, kind of like we were going back to the driving. With alcohol, you can smell it. Um, with edibles, uh, somebody has a hash brownie or whatever, then you're not going to know, right? Except for that they have lots of bags of chips with them or something. I got the munchies, right? So, uh, so it'll be interesting. It'll be an interesting challenge and there'll be lots of training and, and things like that for us coming up and uh, new equipment, but all in due time. So... And it's a changing culture for the rest of us, you know, growing, <coughs> growing up with uh, marijuana as being illegal. It's just a change in that mindset that now all of a sudden, as of boom, this date, it's going to be legal. So how does it make it okay, especially for us with young kids where we're telling them drugs are bad, then all of a sudden, you know, okay, I guess it's not as bad anymore. Like, yeah, it's going to create some challenges at home. <laughs> so. Do you find, oh, sorry, do you find marijuana is popular back in the day, but then cocaine and crystal meth, do you find there's a lot of crystal meth in town? No. No, we're fortunate. Like, if you look in the news right now, you check out what's going on in Winnipeg area. Brandon, oof. Meth is scary, right? Yeah. And um, Thompson, very little of it, thank God. And if it was here, we would know it because you would see a, a sharp increase in uh, your armed robberies and everything else that comes with it because it turns people violent and crazy. So um, right now we have a substantial amount of cocaine in town and marijuana. It's illegal. We just did a search warrant today in cocaine and marijuana, right? So, but we're fortunate we haven't seen um, the fentanyl and we haven't seen a heck of a lot of meth. So. Again, small pockets, but not to the degree to be overly worried that it's going to impact our community. In, in, in the states, a large number of the federal prisoners are because of possession charges. It's, it's really inundated the prisons with that. Have we got that same problem here? A lot of our people. No, we have much more liberal uh, court system where. We don't see as long term for drugs as the states do. The states are very strict, especially uh, on the federal side. Um, yeah, it's, it's not as stringent, so you're not seeing as long as jail time. People that have had previous, previous charges and so on, do you suppose when they legalize it, they're going to be more lenient in some of those areas from their past? Yeah, you know what, it's a good point. Um, probably not. It would probably be uh, it's still, it was viewed upon as being illegal back then, so uh, it, it won't change. They'll still have had an illegal substance. In fact, you're breaking the law. And not That's right. That's right, yeah. Mm hmm Anything else? I was just going to just make a comment. I think they will tell us the quality. And one of the housekeepers had brought me a bag of what we thought was cocaine with probably our skin to come over. It turns out this guy likes to put his coffee in a baggie. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it was really embarrassing for me. But the officer was very kind, and he said, I can't tell by looking at it either. We do have to test it. Yeah, well, that's good. Yeah, it's better to call them. Not that's right. Yeah, 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 because that could happen very easily. Yeah, yeah. And she asked, they they tasted. Oh yeah, if you watch any of the movies, apparently you just rub it on your gums, right? Yeah. So, yeah, but I the hope. The officer was great too. Like he educated us a little bit and said, like you know, the housekeeper shouldn't bring it to you. They shouldn't touch it. You should call us because we wear gloves and if there was fentanyl yeah. or something like that. So educate us a little bit. On mm -hmm. it, so that was really good. Too. Mm -hmm. Well, it's good that you're calling on that stuff, though, so, yeah. Hmm? Let's go back to stats. With your stats going up in 15 and 16, do you think it actually has had anything to do with having the CSOs downtown, that maybe they're bringing a few yep. more people in that you would have missed? Yeah, for sure, because uh, a lot of the time we wouldn't get those calls until somebody was calling on them, and with the CSOs, they're, they're proactively patrolling for that type of activity of disturbances and intoxication. <laughs> um, Versus with us as the RCMP, it's, you know, if we have five, six members working, they're usually working on person's offense files. So 
there's less time to patrol downtown because our emphasis would be dealing with our investigations. Because, as you know, like uh, well, as you may not know, an investigation, like uh, especially like looking at an impaired driving investigation, takes a, a member off the road for four to six hours. You know, and um, that's not even doing the paperwork. That's just getting the person processed. Uh, you know, from roadside, uh, you know, to the breathalyzer, and then back out um, on the street again. So. Uh, doesn't even include doing the court pack and everything. So it's very labor intensive in terms of paperwork for a police officer. So it's, uh, we don't get a lot of proactive time to be down driving around looking for things, right? So. And then back to the home, to the downtown situation too, and dealing, especially with the city and dealing with some of the outlying communities and the different chiefs and MKO and that, uh, what they're telling us too is these, a lot of the people that are in downtown their people want them back in their own home communities, but due to living conditions and, you know, you already got 10 or 12 people to a house, there's actually no way for them to even go back home and live in their communities yep. for a lot of the people. But, you know, Thompson's not the place of choice, but it's the place that at least gives them a, you know, room you bet. some something to eat. So. You bet. The majority of the folks that, uh, that are downtown have homes somewhere else. And, uh, for various reasons, whether they're not allowed back in the community or whether they choose not to go back. Yeah, it's all up to them. So, oh, yeah, really, if you look, it shouldn't be a Thompson issue as such. It's actually a provincial and federal government issue is what we have to start pushing to get, you know, more dollars for the community. So we, and we have to work with them to get them back home, right, and uh, sort of monitor it. Mm. But I think until we take that proactive step and really start stepping on the government's toes and, it will be a Thompson issue, and it really shouldn't be. Uh, something kind of related. So you got, like, bad guys, but you have no jail. Like, how are you guys, are you guys working on trying to get a jail up here? I know it has been attempted. I, I imagine Colleen could probably speak to this a little bit better. <laughs> but <definitely>. Yeah. <laughs> we've been working, the, the, our four-year term, we've been working with the government the whole time. Just because the paw is so close, the sheriffs run them back and forth and then down to Winnipeg at some time. So... Yeah, why Thompson doesn't have one, I don't know. Yeah, it's just a, it's I agree. Yeah. And it was getting a little bit close, not close, but closer with the last government. Now this government has put everything on hold and is revisiting everything. So there's a moratorium for a year put on everything. So yeah. We create jobs here too. That was one of the, oh yeah, for that's sure. One of the, you know, like, if you want to go to the city, we have actually a, you know, a good document on it. And uh, that was part of the thing when we started going, you know, four or five years ago. I think it was even before us. And uh, it was, you know, with the jobs, it was part of the deadly process mm -hmm. to get this facility up here. We're still working. Yeah. Well, especially with the agencies trying to get their kids back home. Well, if they don't have homes to live in, then that's the thing. Yep. Go to the place. Yep. The money spent, eh? Yeah. Yeah. yeah there was so much money wasted on people. My daughter was uh, driving for uh, one of the agencies, and I can't believe the amount of money wasted. Mm -hmm. And it and it never puts the families back together properly. You know, by the time they're, they're apart for that long, it, you know, causes and more trouble. And to Laura, what it takes to visit the family in the city, visiting here with Dennis, and coming to Thompson, visiting and That's right. Going back here. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a tremendous economic driver. It is. Know, having an institution in the community. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of people might say, yeah, but we don't want, because I mean, let's face it, if, if someone's incarcerated, his or her family, probably his family, they're going to move here because they're close to this post. And I've heard the argument about we don't want to be here type thing. And, uh, my answer to that is they're not in jail. He is. You know, I mean, just, he made a mistake, not, not his wife and three little kids. Right? And they have to live somewhere, they have to eat somewhere, they have to buy clothes. Tremendous economic driver. They also have to think, too, when everyone's working these provincial programs, <clears throat> pardon me, including the sheriffs driving prisoners back and forth to the court office. We're talking a very busy court office. Very, very busy. Stepping to Winnipeg at some times first. That's all provincial money. Well, that's our money. That's mm -hmm. not province money. They only get their money from us. Mm -hmm. Well, and feds. But let's face it, when we can save some money, then saving ourselves some money. Mm -hmm. I think I'm glad that council is really working toward that. I would love to see it just from an economic driver perspective and a community safety perspective having an institution in Thompson would be so much beneficial. Mm -hmm. Anyway, speech over circle. Can I just say one thing?
one thing. Um, the RCMP Facebook page, Pam was just mentioning if I was on it, I really love that page because we get to learn a lot of what's going on and they, RCMP have a really great sense of humor about some of the things that they put on there and yeah. interacting with the public. Yeah. And I think that's really helpful. Oh, good, good, good. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's entertaining, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's managed from our folks out of Winnipeg. And I, I had sent them a private message. Which it's a little bit embarrassing, but I'm sure a lot of you heard about the car bomb, the Tim Hortons drive mm -hmm. and the impaired driver. Well, that was my vehicle, but it was not, I did not get that for any person permission. It was stolen from me. Um, and that wasn't mentioned in the article. And it was going around Facebook, and it had, I can't remember how many shares, but it was crazy amounts of shares. Yeah. And it's your vehicle. <laughs> had driven that vehicle for three years, and he's the same age as the person that stole my vehicle. And I didn't want people thinking that was my son. Yeah. Just yeah. a picture of the vehicle. So I private messaged the RCMP through Facebook, through that group, and they responded immediately to me and said, sorry, we'll, we'll uh, edit the story. And they did. And that was mm. great. That's good. Yeah. 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 It is handy. It's an entertaining spot to look to every now and then. Yeah. yeah. Well, especially when it got missing and used, you yep. know, because they're located mm -hmm. in the next couple of days or even that day, so. Yeah, because it was my car, I was, you know, not wanting that story shared, and then my cousin in Toronto shared the story, and I'm like, oh, God, it was shared everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Power of social media, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 <coughs> Any other questions? With the winter games coming and with the influx of people we have coming into the city, are you going to have more staff on, on the street? Yeah, we've taken some steps to have additional resources in place. Now, again, we're, we're anticipating that it's going to be families for the most part, so we're not expecting to see a, a drive in crime or anything like that. It's going to be more of a, there's going to be lots of people in town. So you're going to see more, uh, probably more people calling about things that, you know, if you're living in Brandon, you may call to say that there's somebody having a nap in the snowbank that you normally may not have seen, like those types of things. But, um, yeah, I don't think there's going to be a big driving crime. It just be more traffic, more people, businesses will be busier, that type yeah. of thing. So. Okay. Especially with the first part of the games when it's the beginning of the month. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. Nothing else? I bored you guys to tears. It's good. <laughs> I think there's no lots problem. of questions. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Kevin. Um, stats always worry us, uh, but uh, I think we have to take everything into perspective. Um, we we're just having that conversation that I've been here 22 years. I feel that this is the safest place ever, uh, but then stats come up and uh, they come bite me. Uh, and what I'm saying to other people, but uh, like uh, Chief Lewis says, that we have to take everything in perspective, and uh, that's that's the uh, sort of attitude that we have to uh, portray to visitors as well. That it's only a core group of people that these stats come from, and it's it's not widespread. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, like uh, we said uh, last time. Uh, I'm sure the press uh, and all social media outlets, uh, you know, they, they can project a positive image of Thompson to the rest of uh, the world. With that, I'd like to thank uh, Chief Lewis. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Thank you.